Leadership Lessons Podcast, hosted by Pastor Daniel Williams, a podcast to encourage and equip church leaders. Brought to you by eeleaders.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to another Leadership Lesson, and I am excited to talk about studying the Bible with you. Let's study, let's take time. What does that even look like? Uh, The last few episodes we've been talking about preaching. We want to tell people about Jesus. Part of the mission of our church at Redemption Church, Delray Beach, is to pursue and to proclaim Jesus. We want to proclaim Jesus, but that has to be a ministry uh, from what the Lord has taught us, the revelation He's revealed. It's first we pursue God and then we proclaim Him. And so we have to be students of God's Word before we preach God's Word. And that's what I want to talk to you about today about. Uh, not only for you personally, but as a church leader, for you to grasp this of who you are, uh, to study God's Word, and then to pass it on. Uh, I find in 2 Timothy 2.15 that it's important for us as Christian, not even church leaders, just people of God to study God's Word. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling uh, the Word of Truth. God's Word, the Bible, is true. And, it, and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We are to be in God's Word, under God's authority. Uh, men and women of the word, and this will help our ministry. And when we raise up leaders, we want them to be under God's authority, his rule and reign by the power of the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit has given us God's word for edification, for us to be built up. Um, And so in Redemption Church and leadership development, we talk a lot about the importance of studying the Bible. And so I want to give you a tool today uh, for you to help you to be good students of God's Word. I I love teaching the Bible. I love preaching the Bible. But it first starts with just the Lord speaking to you, you understanding what it simply means. Um, And so my goal is for people to follow Jesus, not follow my opinion, but follow what He has said, His Word. And so I want them to to help study God's Word. You know, I, I look at Acts chapter 17 where Even the Apostle Paul went and preached to the people in um, Berea. And the Bereans, they they listened to what Paul said and they respected and honored his authority and leadership, but they went back to Scripture. And I want to teach everyone that I'm discipling to do that. Not just to go off my opinion, because honestly, my opinions, they change. But God's Word doesn't change. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but God's Word does not change. And this is one of the reasons why at Redemption Church, Delray Beach, we actually study through books of the Bible Because I don't even want my prejudice or my judgment or what I feel like I should be teaching. I want the Spirit to direct our church, to lead us. And there are some hard topics in the Bible, honestly, that do require study. And honestly, if I could be, you know, frank and honest with you, I probably wouldn't even touch. But because they're in the Bible, uh, maybe a hard passage in culture or dealing with certain things, uh, it forces me to teach people what God's Word says. And so I want to help you to know what God's Word says. And so I want to give you this tool. This is just one tool. Uh, It's a simple thing where um, I got from Greg Laurie's Start to Follow book. We, as a church, give this Start to Follow book, a new believers sort of um, workbook, to people as they come and visit our church, as they get saved, as they want to know, answering questions like, um, how do I pray? How do I read the Bible? And it's a simple tool. It all starts with R. It's read, reflect, and respond. Um, This isn't the only tool. I know that there's great study tools like Inductive Bible Study, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, SOAP. um, There's a lot of different methods and tools. And so this isn't the only one, but this is just something that I go through to help people. And I found that it's important to talk about, especially with new believers, especially with old believers. Uh, People that want to know God need to learn how to study the Bible to build their faith. And so I've never met a mature Christian that has not been Uh, mature in their faith and um, neglected the Word of God. They've been men and women of God's Word. And so I want to help you to do that personally, but also give you this tool and teach it in such a way where you can teach other people how to study God's Word because that is um, the responsibilities on us. God and His sovereignty and His goodness has given us uh, 
direction guided us. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We can go to God's word and study it and know who he is and know his heart, uh, but we have to do that. And so read, reflect, and respond. They all start with an R. I know it's cute, but sometimes these things are very helpful for people to just simply uh, remember. Read. When I talk about that word, it's in this section where we want to find out just what does God's word say? What does God's word say? Um, and then we want to process what God's Word says. We want to reflect. Uh, as you discover what God's Word says, you want to take time to consider, what, what does this teach me about God? Remember, the Bible is not necessarily about us. It's about God, and we fit into God's story, and He loves us. Talk, God's Word gives us direction about life, and, and even gives us, uh, helps us to know our identity, that we're made in His image. And so we just want to reflect on what we're reading um, so we want to read the Bible, we want to reflect on it, and then we want to respond. What will I do with what I just learned? This information, this revelation I received from God. You want to try to apply what you have learned. Um, and so let's start with this. This is somewhat uh, a simple, but yet I think a very important thing to say. When we teach people how to study God's Word, the first thing that we need to tell people to do is to read the Bible. We actually have to read it, right? In this section, we find out what God says. Uh, studying is more than just reading, but it does not um, exclude reading. We have to first read God's Word to understand it. God has given us a mind, and we're to worship with our minds. And so, 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Until I come, devote yourself to public reading of the Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And this, this is the reason why we have to say this to people that we're discipling um, and can't just blow by this point. Because a lot of people are just illiterate in our culture. Not just with the Bible, um, although they are, but just in general. I don't know the statistic off of my uh, head that I've come across many times, but I know that a high percentage of our culture does not read or finish a book after they graduate high school or college. Significantly, like 80 something percent of people don't even finish a normal book like a John Grisham book or um, The Hobbit, anything like that after high school, after college. And so we're dealing with a culture right now that isn't reading uh, books. They're used to reading tweets and statuses and little articles and stuff like that. Even now, if you go to a blog, what's really unpopular is it will say 1200 words, six minute read. Uh, we have a short attention span, and so this discipline of reading uh, has sort of been lost. But it's important for us as Christians to know this is a part of our faith, and this is important. Um, Warren Wiersbe said this, God gave us an inspired book to read. Now, we preach from it, we write books about it, support scholars to study it, establish churches and schools to teach it. Whether you accept it or not, if you are part of the Christian church, you are part of a community that for centuries has embraced education as well as training. We are to train people and that requires our mind, it requires reading, it requires education to learn what has God said. And so oftentimes part of the reason we don't go to the Bible is because we do not see the importance of the Bible. And what, what is the Bible? Can we just take another step back? What is the Bible? Well the Bible is a supernatural book inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we have to tell people this, that the, the book, the Bible is actually, Biblios, it's 66 books with over 40 authors, expanding a, a period of 1,500 years with three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and it has one message. That's right. And some of the most fundamental questions about life, about salvation, about who God is, uh, his will, creation, they all align up and say the same thing. And people need to know that this is an incredible manuscript. This is an amazing book. We can't even unify ourselves on political parties or how to solve a problem or some of the key issues that we face in our culture. Matter of fact, sometimes my friends can't even decide what restaurant we want to go to altogether. But yet in this book, the Bible, over 40 authors that didn't even know each other, some of them, that lived in different cultures, different time periods, they all come in alignment and unity, which is an incredible thing about who God is. How do you know God? What is He like? Because the Holy Spirit has revealed to these men uh, who God is and spoke on His behalf. 
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And we need to tell people the importance of God's word, that it is something for us to be equipped by, that God has ordained this book to build our faith. 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21 says, Knowing this, first off, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy that is ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We, we need to impart this on people. We need to embrace this. How many times do you have a problem and you go to your friends or you go to a psychiatrist or you go to all these different resources to help you, but the thing is, is God has given us this greatest resource, His Word, uh, to be able to help us in our life, to know Him, to build our faith. The Bible says that it gives us guidance for our life. Psalm 119.105, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. God speaks through the Bible. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit of joints of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It can actually discern the thoughts and the intentions of your heart and pierce through that. All the, the culture, the craziness, the, the, the stuff going on and actually minister straight to your soul. It doesn't return void. It's not a waste of your time. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11 says, As for the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but the water of the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be as it goes forth from my mouth. It shall not to return to me empty, but it shall accomplish which I purpose, and shall succeed in it a thing for which I send it. Oftentimes we don't read the Bible because maybe we don't get anything out of it or we think, oh, it's just a waste of time or whatever. No, God promises it's not a waste of time. It won't return void. It will go forth and produce life because when God speaks, he produces life. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and he did that by the word of his mouth, the power. He spoke nothing into existence and he could still speak life into our souls by his word and he does that. And he says that his word is the final authority. Matthew 24, 23, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Psalm 138, 2b says, for, we have exalt, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. God, is, God has exalted his name and his word. Uh, he wants us to exalt his word for us to know, for us to be men and women of God's word. And so when we talk about reading, we need to share with this with people. We need to understand what we're reading, that this is a supernatural book. And it's a trustworthy book. Uh, I don't have all the quotes and all the stuff, but there's a great article that Charlie Campbell wrote um, answering how the Bible is trustworthy through prophecy, historical accuracy. I will try to put the link in the show notes so you can just read it and be blessed and utilize it. One, one thing that I, I do when I teach people the importance of reading the Bible is just give them prophetic, important um, fulfillments of God's word because I want them to see that, that what God says goes, that this is supernatural, that's important, that, that we can trust the Bible. And see, when we read the Bible, we actually get to know Jesus. This is the whole point of the Bible, uh, for us to know Jesus and have eternal life. Um, John 5.39 says, Jesus says, You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. John 20.31, the author of this gospel, writing about Jesus' life, he actually writes the reason why he wrote this entire gospel about Jesus. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We should look to Jesus in our Bible study. Now listen, if we miss Jesus, we're missing the whole thing. It isn't just to do a whole bunch of to-do lists and rules or maybe find a verse to give us guidance about what we're to do today. Although those things are important and although the Bible does address and give us principles and morals and, and guidance in those ways, it always is directing us to the heart of who God is. And Jesus is the living word. And so through this living word, we receive eternal life. And what is eternal life? To know Jesus, to enjoy Jesus. Do you understand the value of just reading and getting to know your best friend? 
the creator of the heavens and the universe. He wants to know you and give you eternal life. Take away your sins. This is some good news. And and oftentimes we just blow by it. Don't don't even, don't even talk about reading the Bible. It's okay if you're bored sometimes. It's okay if you don't get anything out of it. Uh, the people need to understand and how to process these emotions and understand it's important to read the Bible. And so we need to read. And I would say this, because it's a supernatural book, we need to pray before we read the Bible. In our reading process, we need to pray before we read the Bible. You know, it's summer right now. I love summer break. The schedule is amazing. We're doing Saturday nights. We're doing Tuesday nights. I'm staying up late. I'm hanging out with my kids. It's just awesome. I remember when I was a young uh, kid and just like summer break, it would be like just playing basketball all day, tree forts, swimming, picking cherries. I mean, I just, I, I hated school. It was a lot of work. It didn't come to me easy. Um, school was my enemy. And so summer break was just a relief, right? Uh, to top it off with schoolwork, I hated reading. And I remember the reading summer program. It was just, it was the worst. I hated grammar. I still do. I'm still not the best at it. Praise the Lord for a supernatural gift of teaching because this is the only way that I'm able to express God's truth to people. It is by the grace of God that I'm able to even read, to write, to communicate. Um, and in the summertime, I remember just such a relief like, oh, I don't have to read. That pressure of just like, oh, I don't get to do this anymore because I hated to read. And I think a lot of people have that when they graduate high school, when they graduate college, they're just, oh, I, just, I hate to read. I don't like it. And I would just say this, ask God to change your heart. Here, here's a crazy thing. When I say pray before you read, um, I prayed and asked God, listen, I, I want to know you. I know the value. I see it, but I just hate reading. Would you change my heart? And the crazy thing is he, he literally changed my heart. I would actually say that I'm a reader. Right behind me in this video, if you're watching, uh, there's a whole book case of books that I just read. I, I've literally uh, incorporated that in my life. The Lord really did a work, a special work, to just answer my prayer, to give me a heart to read his word and to read, uh, to be a reader. And I think we miss it if we go to God's word and we don't pray. And this is something we see in the Psalms all the time. Psalm 119, 18, the psalmist says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Don't rush the process. Talk to God. Ask him to teach you when you read the Bible. Psalm 25, four through five, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me into your truth. Teach me, for you are God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And so, some practical things you can do before you read the Bible is just simply understand the importance of it. And so, pray. Ask God to do the supernatural work in your heart. And then some physical things I thought as well is, you know, when you read, you want to find a quiet, comfortable spot. Um, somewhere where you can not be interrupted, uh, whether that be a comfortable chair, a couch, like, right, you don't want to read in bed when you're tired. Uh, and that's another thing. I know that most people and most Christians say that, you know, to be godly, you got to wake up at five in the morning and read the Bible. Well, maybe that's not the most effective thing for you. Now, we should start our day off with God. I absolutely agree. In prayer, in devotion, in seeking God and getting our mind before it, all this stuff goes on. But what if you wake up at 9 in the morning? Or what if you wake up at 7 and you're most awake at noon? Maybe you take your lunch break and you read God's Word then. Maybe you, maybe you listen to a podcast on the way to work or pray on the way to work and then read the Bible. You want to read when you have a lot of energy because I know for me, I sometimes fall asleep when I read. Sometimes reading before bed actually helps me sleep. And so maybe that be, be the case for you. So you don't want to read the Bible at night because it just helps you fall asleep. When do you have the most energy? It's a very practical thing, but think about it. You have a lot of energy. You go to a quiet spot. And then I would say, as you read, choose a systematic way to read. Whether that be topical, maybe you do a, a search on suffering and all the verses that God talks about suffering, or, or maybe you have Bible apps for that. Um, right now, our church is reading about four to five chapters a week. Um, and we're reading together. That's a system. Or maybe this summer, we've done in the past reading all of the Proverbs or Psalms. What's your plan? What's your game plan? Uh, I think it's a really good thing for you just to read through books of the Bible. If each book, 
There are 66 books in the Bible. Each book gives you context. And, and, and is this a piece of uh, poetry? Is this history? Is this an epistle instruction? Knowing these things is really important. We would never pick up a normal book and just say, Hey, I'll just see. I need guidance, sir. I want to know what the story is and just read a random page. And if we read that random page, we may think, Oh, the story is terrible. The character is in turmoil and we never finish the end. See, we need to systematically read the Bible to understand it, to understand the context of it. And it helps us because if we're reading chapter 1 and we don't have enough time to finish, we pick up on where we left off and we just keep on going through it. And so we don't have to feel guilty. And once we have this plan, I would say a practical thing for us is to, to read it with people, to have loving accountability, to process this reading with people. And as you do this, my last tip would be just read every day. Listen, quality is better than quantity. Don't compare yourselves to other people like you have to read for an hour and a half. What is your pace? Can you give 15 minutes? The Lord can work in 15 minutes. See, see how much you can read in 15 minutes. Uh, you know, um, maybe you have a 30 minute gap of a drive. Maybe you go in your audio book or your audio Bible and just play it in the car and you listen. What's the process? What works for you? Um, you need to find those rhythms and you need to read. Well, that's a, a big thing, a big process, because I wanted you to see the importance of reading the Bible, but there's more to the study part of it, right? We have to first read the Bible, but then we need to reflect. This section means as you discover what God's Word says, because you're reading it, you will take some time to consider what um, this teaches you about God about life, about yourself, right? Have you ever read something? Literally, I've done this all so many times. You've read like a whole paragraph or a page and you have no idea what you just read. It's the worst. Even right now, I know that people listening to this podcast, they haven't really fully embraced everything I've said because they've been thinking about something else. Um, something went into their mind, uh, distracted them, whatever it may be, whatever the case may be. Um, and that happens all the time. The, the process of reflecting is for you to slow down and for you to understand what this text means. Because our minds get so distracted. Reading is observing, but reflecting is interpreting. You, you just read it. What does it say? But now you want to say, okay, what does this mean? And part of this is the study process where you just reflect, you process, you pray. And this just takes time. It's really a biblical word. What the Bible talks about is meditation. Um, I know with Eastern mysticism and religion, meditation is really uh, sort of a negative word in the Christian culture because when you hear meditation in, in, in American society or in culture, you think of emptying yourself. But the Bible actually says meditation is something where you actually reflect whatever is pure, lovely, just. Think on these things where you, where you actually take every thought captive and you, you in, incorporate God's truth in your mind and you just reflect and meditate and process. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in you. For then you will make your ways, uh, then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have good success. Oftentimes we only take a few minutes to read, 15, 30 minutes in the morning, but we want to have that in our soul, in our mind, processing that throughout the day. Psalm 119.97 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. We're to worship God with our minds to process this. And so it's really important to get it into our brains and process, meditate, think, ponder. And one of the ways that we do this is simply by just asking questions, thinking about it. Uh, we have to control our thought life, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. To give you an illustration, I read across this article by Rick Warren, uh, amazing, godly, great leader, talking about chewing the cud. Chewing the cud. Uh, it's the cow's eating process. Uh, and he talked about this process of how cows eat and chew the cud. And it's actually a picture, a great picture of how we're to meditate and reflect on God's word. And so the article said, how do we do it? Speaking of meditation, well, grab a dictionary and look up a synonym for meditation and you'll probably find the word rumination. You probably don't know what that word means unless you happen to be a farmer. Rumination is what a cow does when she chews her cud. She rolls her cud over and over in her mouth. That's similar to how you meditate on scripture. 
Cows eat the grass, chew it up, and send it to their stomachs pretty quickly. There it lies in the stomach, soaking up all of those acids and chemicals. Then after a while, the cow burps it back with a new and renewed flavor, chews on the grass and some other grass, and does the whole process again all over again. Now cows repeat this several times. They get every ounce of nutrition out of the grass. Biblical meditation, he says, is kind of like that. It's thought digestion. God wants us to get every ounce of spiritual nutrition out of his word, and he wants us to chew on it, digest it, then chew on it some more. Do you get what I'm saying? We're to reflect. We're not just to read it, it's to do, it's done. We're to meditate on it. We're to live it out. We're, we're, we're to do this. Uh, we're to memorize scripture. You know, Psalm 119.11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's so important for us to work with the Holy Spirit. His role is to point us to Jesus, and he is, his role is also to bring back things that we have heard from Jesus and who he is. He'll bring verses to your mind, and so it's important for us to read God's Word, to reflect on it, and allow the Holy Spirit to help us in this process. Uh, what, what really helps uh, people journal sometimes, putting practical tips, is just simply journaling, taking out uh, and writing down out your thoughts. I know for me it's sort of weird because I do a podcast, but I actually speak my thoughts out loud. I process better when I'm able to be with a, a, a crowd of people and to talk through it. And oftentimes when we're studying God's Word and we're reflecting on it, <clears throat> pardon me, it actually helps us to write things down, to process it, or to talk the Scripture out loud with people in our lives. And so usually, even before like a message like this or when I'm studying the Word of God, I'll actually have a piece of paper and a pencil with me, and I'll just, just write things out, stuff that comes to my mind. It just helps me clear my thoughts and meditate on it. And a great way, another practical way, and a study tip to reflect um, and to process God's Word is just simply to ask questions. Again, you're taking time with the text. You're not rushing through it. You're meditating it all day. And so you're asking uh, inductive Bible study method questions. And what I'll try to do in the, the show notes is, is create a link where you could download a PDF with just tons of questions. More than the who, what, when, where, why. But even those questions can lead to more questions. Like, who are the characters in this section? Well, what are they feeling? Why do you think their response was this? How would I feel if I was doing that? If I dealt, dealt with that discouragement or this situation? What was God trying to get across here? What does this mean to my life? You just keep on asking questions. And, and Jesus was a genius at that. He allowed people to process things by asking people questions. It's an important way that we actually learn. Rather than just saying, this is the truth, self-discovery. This is oftentimes in Bible study groups, there's just a leader that just facilitates questions and reads the Word. And, and many times we get so, many, so much out of these Bible studies with not someone just preaching, but actually helping us to discover God's truth. Because it's a part where we can meditate and reflect slowly on God's Word. And it's beneficial. And so we want to read. We want to reflect but we also, most importantly, want to respond. We're talking about studying God's Word. And it would be a shame to study God's Word, to put all this work in, and then not apply it to our lives. When we talk about respond, we have to ask a question, what will we do with what we just learned? How will we apply it? You want to try to apply what you just learned. And this is a very important process uh, in your study time. How does it apply to my life? Or you can ask, so what? All right, I just read this. I just learned this. It taught me about Jesus. He forgives sin, but so what? Well, I have some sin in my life. I need to confess. I need his forgiveness. Lord, would you forgive me? Uh, this is a, an important process where we apply God's word to our understanding. Remember, understanding is not just head knowledge. Uh, the Bible talks about an experience, a knowledge that we would experience it, not just understand it. Knowledge can sometimes puff us up. In American society, we, uh, we pride ourselves in education, knowing a lot of things, especially if you have Google. Uh, if you're in the dark in something, in a conversation, people naturally just go to their Google and just type in that information and get it immediately. But the reality is, is the Bible talks about where to have wisdom. 
We're to understand knowledge and apply it. It isn't just thinking a lot about God's word, it's applying it to our lives. Jesus said in Luke eleven eighteen 18 that we're blessed to not only hear God's word, but if we keep God's word. The Psalmist 119, 2 says, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. And so I know for us, we try to implement um, loving accountability through community groups to apply scripture. One of the, the questions that we commonly ask people in our church and the people we're discipling is just simply like, what is Jesus teaching you? And how, how are you applying it? Is there anything I can help you to apply that? We want to give loving accountability and have people in our place. It's a very practical thing because I think sometimes when we talk about studying God's Word, we think our own, our own process, our own quiet time, our devotion time. But we're to live out our faith in community, and it helps us. How can we apply God's Word? Who can we tell and say, hey, could you keep me accountable? Can I process this with you? How are you applying it? What do you see? That's why it's so important to study with God's community, to be under His authority, and to read Scripture together, to study Scripture together. Going to service every week is a great rhythm to be in a church family, a gathering, and studying the same thing so you can process throughout the week and talk about it. So oftentimes, uh, these little disciplines are so um, hard to do, right? It doesn't seem very, very hard uh, or very complicated. Okay, read the Bible reflect, and then say, how does it apply to me? But oftentimes these little things can create great dividends and they're hard to do. Second Timothy, we've been a lot in that book um, because I think it's a fatherly book to minister a church leader, Timothy, where Paul is giving his final instruction. He says, rather, train yourself for godliness. Don't be puffed up. Don't get the degree. Don't just know the Bible and memorize scripture um, just so you can say it. But, but train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, and it is hard to do, godliness is of value in every way and it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. I believe God wants us to be spiritually in shape and reading the Word of God is a spiritual discipline that is important for your life and for the people that you are discipling and leading. And so there are many methods, but this is just one tool that you can apply today, but you can also teach people. Read the Bible. Teach people what, what the Bible is. It's a supernatural book. It's important. And reflect on it. Uh, you want to process. You want to meditate on it. You want to memorize it. I mean, get into God's Word and let it take your thoughts and, and your life. And then, and then it's God is speaking to you in His Word because this is a living book going directly to your soul, speaking to you. Apply it. Ask for prayer. Not only from God to understand His Word, but from other people. Hey, I'm going through this. God's teaching me. Would you, would you continue to pray to help me like be a better dad or a husband or, or to know God? And I was just thinking about, man, I just want to be, oh, God, I just want to be kind. Help me to be kind. It's a fruit of the Spirit. But Lord, would you just teach me how to be kind to people? That's important questions to ask, important prayers to say. But remember, do your best. We started this time in this study talking about studying God's Word. From a biblical principle, 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Listen, do your best. If you have an hour, if you have 30 minutes, if you have five hours, whatever it may be, study the scripture and follow God when he speaks to you. Take this tool to read, to reflect, to respond. Pursue Jesus for yourself and then proclaim him to other people. We've been talking a lot about preaching preaching, but we need to preach to ourselves. We need to preach um, and understand what God's Word is, and to be able to do that, we need to study, and that takes time and hard work. And so, um, I hope this helps. I hope this helps you. Uh, just a simple tool to read, reflect, and respond. And I'm praying that you uh, come under the authority of the Word of God, and that you um, follow Him, and you build your faith by hearing the Word of God. And so, um, I thought it would be really important for us to continue this conversation. And there's a video series by a person that's been on this podcast before, Brian Saylor, up in uh, Calvary Chapel, Melbourne. He's a young uh, college age pastor and him and his team are great. And they put a three part series, him and his wife, just about the, the importance of reading the Bible, some more practical tips. And part of E Leaders is not only to encourage you, but to give you great content, to talk to you practically about ministry and these type of things. And so hopefully this tool is effective, but there's another tool that I wanna 
sort of guide you to, and I'll put the link in the show notes, uh, a three-part video series by Brian and his wife on studying the Bible. And this is going to be part two of the series. I thought it would be just a little glimpse, a little clip oh, to wipe your appetite. It's about eight to ten minute clip, uh, just in processing and talking about the trustworthiness of the Bible. Because again, I think a lot of people don't go to the Bible because they have these practical questions. And so we as leaders need to answer these questions for ourselves, but then answer these questions for people that we're discipling as well. And so here's uh, Brian and Katie Saylor talking about just the Bible and studying the Bible and answering these practical questions. And I know you're going to be blessed by it. So here is Brian and Katie Saylor. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out this video. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary Chapel in Melbourne. I'm here with my wife, Katie. Hello, Katie. Hello. This is part two of a video series called How to Read the Bible. And we thought we'd record these videos to help you learn how to read the Bible. In our first video, we talked about three excuses for not reading the Bible. And in this video, we want to answer the question, is the Bible trustworthy? So Katie, a lot of people have a lot of things to say about whether the Bible is trustworthy. Professors, uh, people on the news, there's a lot of people who have a lot of criticisms about the Bible. Yeah. But what we want to do is just talk about sort of three reasons that we believe the Bible is trustworthy. Yes. The first reason is this. There is external evidence that the Bible is trustworthy. So what do you have to say about sort of the external evidence of the Bible? Right. So external evidence is evidence that is outside of the Bible itself that shows that it is, in fact, reliable. So one of the big criticisms that people will have about the Bible is that, oh, it was written thousands and thousands of years ago and the stories have changed over time. Uh, people have, have written things that aren't true, that type of thing. Um, so the basically question whether or not the Bible we're reading today is the same as the Bible that was written in the time of Christ or before. Right, like people will say that it's a giant game of telephone. Exactly. One person wrote something over time, it's evolved and changed. The story changes, right. So I think one of the things to remember though is that one of the ways that we can know whether or not a book is trustworthy is by counting the amount of manuscripts, the amount of copies that we have, and then how early those copies were written, hmm. um, how close they were to the original manuscript. Makes sense. So. Uh, with some other books, some other famous ancient texts that we read, uh, for example, Plato's Republic. Mm -hmm. That book, uh, we have about seven manuscripts of Plato's Republic, and it was written around 1,500 years wow. within the original uh, time period. Wow. So that's still a book that we believe is true. We believe that that book we are reading is the same one that Plato actually wrote. Wow. Uh, another good example would be Homer's Iliad. Uh, we have around 643 manuscripts, manuscript copies of that book, and they were dated around 500 years of the original. And again, widely accepted as true. We read it in high school. There's no question of whether or not that book is the same one that Homer wrote. So both of those, there's a massive gap between the original and the copies we have. And in the case of Plato, only seven copies, but exactly. we still consider it to be trustworthy. Exactly. Now the New Testament, on the other hand, we have 5,600 manuscripts. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot of the New Testament, and they're dated within 100 years wow. of the original. So what that means for us is, since they are dated so close within yeah. the original, we can be more confident that there were not changes made, Incredible. that people didn't have time to alter it, and we have so many copies that are all the same, yeah. um, which really shows that the Bible we're reading today is the same one that was written at that time. That is amazing. Like That is a lot of evidence. That's a lot. And not to mention, these copies are spread throughout Europe and Asia. Exactly. So they're not all in one place. Right, they're everywhere. And we have a lot of archeological evidence as well that backs up what the Bible is saying. That's awesome. So we've talked about external evidence. Let's talk about internal evidence. What do we mean when we talk about internal evidence? So internal evidence is looking within the Bible itself to show that it's reliable. So when you, have, when you look at the Bible, there's about 40 authors that were involved with writing the book and they all agree. Hmm. There are no major contradictions throughout the Bible. Um, we're talking about a book that's written over 1,500 years, 40 authors, lots of different types of literature, and they all have the same story. They all agree, yeah. um, which is pretty impressive. And, yeah. and there's a lot of talk about there being errors in the Bible and contradictions and things like that. The vast majority of these 
errors, our copyist errors, meaning that when someone was copying the manuscripts, they wrote A instead of an, or they wrote T-H-E-E -E instead of T-H-E. Right. Um, so they're very, very minor issues, yeah. and they absolutely do not affect the message of the scripture in any way. Yeah. So when we hear a professor or someone talking about the massive amount of errors, really what we should be thinking about is a guy in a cave right. taking one copy and copying it to someone else with a tiny little candle. Mm -hmm. He makes one error. That doesn't mean the Bible has an error. Right. That just means one of the copies contains a minor spelling error. Exactly. Awesome. So external evidence, internal evidence, and the last thing that we want to talk about is fulfilled prophecy. Right. So when we read the Old Testament, we see hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that are all pointing toward a Messiah, hmm. pointing toward Jesus Christ. These prophecies were all fulfilled in one man, Jesus. Yeah. And people will say, well, it's just a coincidence. Jesus just happened to fulfill some of these prophecies. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, if you were to take the entire state of Texas, cover it in silver dollars to a depth of around two feet, hmm. pick up one silver dollar, mark it, throw it into the state, and then have a blind man wander into the state randomly, stoop down, pick up a silver dollar, the chances of him picking up the marked silver dollar wow. are the same as Jesus randomly fulfilling only eight wow. of these prophecies. Dang, that's crazy. And he, in fact, filled hundreds. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And we know from science and from archaeology that the prophecies were, in fact, written hundreds of years before from things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and other right. things like that. So somebody didn't come along behind him and fill in the blanks. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's super encouraging. External evidence, internal evidence, and fulfilled prophecy all point to the fact that God wrote the Bible and that the Bible we have in our hands right now is the same one that God wrote yeah. thousands of years ago. Exactly. So we can trust the Bible. Well, we hope that this was encouraging to you. We hope this gives you confidence to read the Bible. Check out part three of this series. We are going to be giving some super practical ways to read the Bible. I hope it really helps you. We'll see you in part three. Well, that was a little fun video talking about studying the Bible, and I hope that helped. And remember, uh, you can go to the show notes. You can probably Google Brian Saylor on YouTube and find the three-part series, but the show notes will make it easy, the link, um, for you to just check out part one and also part three. I think practical tools like this being very help are very helpful, not only for you as a church leader, but um, also the resources that you can send to other people. Again, this is a podcast with no marketing uh, budget. This is just by you. If it's been blessing you, man, please share it with your friends, with your family, social media. I also have all the audio and video uh, of all these things individually on eeleaders.com that you can actually glean from, get, share on social media, these type of things. Uh, there's some incredible content that's been going on. I'm so blessed to be able to continue this podcast, continue this process, as it just was a simply put on my heart by the Lord for me to grow, to learn, to archive these things, and just to share um, with people the things that God has taught me. Uh, I've had so many amazing leaders and friends pour into me, and it's just a blessing to be able to have these people pour now into you. And so next time, um, I'm going to talk about uh, another lesson I'm going to do just about the importance of hard work. Listen, if we talked about studying God's word and preaching and doing all these things, building a team, we need to have some good expectations, some clear expectations that ministry is tough. You are not alone in this. It does take a lot of work, but listen, you do not labor in vain. It is worth it. And so I just want to encourage you in that, let you know that you're not alone, let you know that I'm praying for you. And so next uh, week's episode, I'll be sharing on the importance of hard work and how that applies to ministry and how that actually can encourage your soul. And so, man, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate your time. I hope these things are valuable to you. God bless, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to this Leadership Lessons podcast. You can watch all the episodes and get all the show notes at eeleaders.com. If this podcast was a blessing to you, I would love for you to share it with your friends on social media. You can find us on social media at eeleaders. You can also help us spread the word by simply writing a review on iTunes or Google Play. My hope for you with this podcast is that it will encourage you and equip you to continue to serve Jesus. Because remember, there's nothing better than doing what God has called you to do.